The famous Russian Bolshoi Ballet, rehearsing its new production of Spartacus at London's Royal Opera House. Recording the dances with ink and paper from the Royal Box is London artist Alan Halliday. For over 20 years, Halliday has attended dress rehearsals and performances with his sketch pad, inkwell and brush. He draws quickly as the action on stage develops, rapidly turning out drawings which he fills in with colours later. Halliday's ambition is to archive major ballets, opera and theatre productions. He's already documented paintings from over 700 stage productions. In an age of digital imaging, Halliday's work seems almost out of fashion, but that doesn't deter him. He believes that painting from life brings a unique quality of immediacy to his pictures. Halliday works as quickly in his studio as he does in the theatre. He fills in the colours and textures of sets and costumes from memory. He uses watercolour paints for the Kirov Ballet of St. Petersburg because their productions are light and airy. But he uses thicker gouache paints for the Bolshoi because their work stands out, more like a circus poster. Halliday does not sell his paintings to theatre or dance companies, but gives them away freely when they are requested. They appear in theatre programs and exhibitions. His compensation is to receive access to the companies as they rehearse. Halliday has painted numerous companies over the last 24 years. His extensive archive of paintings includes these images from the Kirov Opera, the Kirov Ballet, the Royal Ballet, the Karakela Dance Theatre of Lebanon, and of course, Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet. He has also painted with the New York City Ballet and on the set of the film Shakespeare in Love. Halliday says few other artists have visited London's West End Theatre District for long periods of time. His is the only work continuously recording stage productions. An ear-splitting female drum troupe is pushing forward the frontiers of the neglected art of percussion. Drumming up a storm, a group of Chinese women are smashing stereotypes in the hope of creating a new appreciation of the art of percussion. Forget the guipao wearing cliché of the traditional Chinese female, these women use every muscle and sinew to sweat out a resounding rhythm. Billing themselves as China's only all-female percussion group, Red Poppy was launched in 1999. Their repertoire runs the gamut between traditional Chinese drum music, xylophone routines and modern percussion. Percussion is generally regarded as a male preserve, but the members of Red Poppy believe women have something to contribute to the art, bringing a much needed soft touch, usually absent from the macho beat of the drum. In China, the percussion section is normally relegated to a position backstage, but the Red Poppy band is determined to shake up preconceptions by putting it center stage. The group is made up of graduates from the Beijing Conservatory of Music, one of the most prestigious music schools in the country. Most have studied drumming for at least seven years and are proficient in a variety of styles. But the music they play is conceived and designed by professors at the conservatory. The band is subjected to a gruelling training program, both musical and physical. While the beat of Red Poppy's drums is already resonating through the international pop scene, in China they are still unknowns.
this group have released their first CD, hoping to make China pulse to the beat of the drum. The world's oldest model village is Beckenscott, a 1930s creation that became an inspiration for similar projects around the world. And it's retained its ability to delight visitors of all ages. The man who built Beckenscott was Roland Kellingham, a wealthy accountant in the village of Beaconsfield, less than an hour from London. His wife also played a part, since it was her refusal in 1929 to allow any more model trains in their house that forced him to look outside. Since then, the village has received over 13 million visitors, with the proceeds going to various charities. A touch of eccentricity is the hallmark of the village. Every villager is individually made, and there's always something happening in a village caught in a time warp. Beckenscott even has a local burglar who has escaped from police cells on the high street. Just as Beckenstock became a yardstick for other model villages, the original creator liked to bring the world's landmarks to his pride and joy. Children, even in the technical age, still find plenty to enjoy. Roland Callingham's aim was to provide simple delight for all, whether young or old. Over 75 years, his wife's urging to take his train set and play outdoors has brought pleasure to millions. Customers in a cafe in the western Turkish city Izmir drink their coffee against a setting of sculptures of faces made out of shoes watching them from the walls. An artist living in Izmir is now exhibiting his work of shoe face sculptures in the cafe. Old and used shoes find new faces in Fikret Ate's hands. By folding, wrapping and cutting, Ate turns a shoe into a smiling face. It started a few years ago when he was bored at home and experimented with making something out of an old pair of shoes. And that was the start of his artistic journey. After working for a year, Ate gained the first recognition from his shoe faces. Some collectors from France commissioned 200 shoe sculptures from him and the requests and commissions continued to be made. He now sees people's feet in a weird kind of way, assessing the shoes people are wearing for suitability as faces. Ate has some new projects he's planning. He wants to use some old clothes this time as a material for his new project. The reproduction of famous paintings out of clothes and shoes, especially a Mona Lisa. One hundred and twenty volunteers spent five hours using over eight hundred thousand begonias to decorate Brussels' grand place. The carpeted grand place tradition dates back to 1971 and has proved increasingly successful, attracting scores of tourists to the Belgian capital. Every two years, the historical centre of Brussels is adorned with another kind of carpet. Mm. 
Some luxurious hotels are now proposing successful special packages to bring in tourists for this special event. Art Nouveau is the theme of this operation. Brussels being the cradle of this artistic trend, founded by Victor Horta at the end of the 19th century. The 1850s square metre begonia carpet was inspired by well-known Horta stained glass. Despite rainy weather, the carpet attracted thousands of visitors, with hundreds queuing to see the carpet from the town hall balcony. Organisers expected over 100,000 people to visit the grand place. A rare example of a log from a convict ship to Australia was sent to auction, giving a rare chance to view it. The Marquis of Cornwallis, its captain, crew and 244 convicts set sail from Ireland on August 9, 1795 on a journey that would change the lives of many on board. Violence overshadowed the first half of the voyage. Captain Michael Hogan was himself an Irishman who made his fortune as a merchant and slave trader after going to sea at the age of 10. Criminal penalties were harsh then. Many convicts faced the choice of the death penalty or transportation, even for minor crimes. The youngest on board was a 12-year-old boy sentenced to transportation for highway robbery. The oldest to land in Sydney Cove was a 65-year-old man. Captain Morgan also made a new life, settling in New York in 1804. A Thai businessman and amateur art enthusiast has spent the last 20 years trying to prove that a family-owned portrait is an undiscovered Picasso. After a career in banking, specialising in spotting faked signatures and phony documents, Sita Sitienu Krid's expertise is now focused solely on trying to prove that the faded name at the bottom of the pastel portrait is that of the Spanish master. His self-penned book, Discovered Picasso in Thailand, is the result of a decade-long quest which saw him quit his job, travel across continents and even learn Spanish in the hope of proving that this portrait is an adolescent work by the Spanish master. Old letters, signature analysis and style comparisons with known Picassos make up the bulk of the book, with a final section of endorsements by local artists and art historians. Sita named the pastel Original Carmen, as he believes it to be the same woman depicted in Picasso's 1889 charcoal sketch, Carmen. The painting has been in Thailand for over a hundred years, after reportedly being given to King Rama V when visiting Queen Maria Cristina of Spain in 1897. But critics question how Picasso, an unknown 16-year-old at the time, could have gotten such royal recognition. Picasso created more than 20,000 works of art in his 92 years. So far, no international experts have stepped forward to back the claims being made by the Thai consortium. But if proved genuine, it is thought original Carmen could sell for up to 200,000 US dollars.
Sita says his next step is to find out the story of the model behind Carmen. Claiming Martha Stewart as her inspiration, this popular TV host in Beijing is teaching up-and-coming middle-class women how to turn their houses into homes. TV host Zhao Zhu is explaining to her viewers that in Western countries, soup is for eating, not the after-dinner beverage it is in China. Today's show has a Russian theme, and Zhao is coaching her audience through stirring up a watery version of borscht. Part Martha Stewart and part Chinese housewife, Zhao Zhu brings Western suburban living to Beijingers who can afford to retreat into the quiet of their brand new homes. In the throes of a real estate boom growing 40% a year, China has opened its doors to pioneers like Zhao, selling a lifestyle of leisure to the nation's 130 million strong middle class. Zhao arrived on the scene in Beijing armed with ideas gleaned from years of watching Food Network, Home and Garden Show, and Martha Stewart while a young mother in the US. The market for an exotic Western lifestyle was just maturing in the bustling city of 14 million when she stepped in with her first self-produced show. The show is shot in an unfurnished luxury villa, donated by a real estate company happy to see its logo splashed on the program's opening title. Appliances, pots and pans, and spices, all foreign companies anxious for brand awareness among China's up-and-coming, crowd the well-stocked studio kitchen. The program's concept is novel in a country where domestic help is available for a few dollars a day. Zhao admits the show was a business risk, pitching the joys of Western cooking, crafts, and decorating to a demographic dependent on their house help. But producers believe that baking heart-shaped cookies or making a picture frame from a postcard are joys that the Chinese need to discover. Jojo Good Living has plans to expand its coverage by bringing the finer points of life into metropolitan centres Shanghai, Yangzhou and Shenzhen. Residents of the Ukrainian village of Sirniki have to find novel ways of asserting their identities. Over 3,000 of them have the same family name, Poluhovic. No one knows why so many of the villagers share the same name, but village legend says it dates back to a 17th century duke. His name is long forgotten, but according to the legend, he granted the local peasants their freedom. To make things simple, as the peasants had no official names, he gave the same name to each of them. And so it went on, generation after generation, until over 3,000 people are said to have ended up with the surname Poluhovic. In Ukraine, it is traditional for children to be given their father's name, as well as a first name and a surname. For example, Poluhovic Ivan Ivanovich. Even with the combination of all three of these names, there are still 57 people in the village with exactly the same name. The principal of the local school, herself a Palukovic, says there are many Palukoviches. Most pupils are Palukoviches. They even have three Palukovic Ivan Ivanoviches in one class. For the village accountant, it is even more vital to get the right Palukovic. But there is at least one benefit of so many Palukovics. If ever you find yourself a stranger in trouble in the village of Serniki, calling out Polukovic should bring at least a couple of people to your assistance. They make up around 1 in 10 of the population, but left-handed people claim the rest of the right-handed world does not fully appreciate the difficulties they experience living in a world designed for those who lead with their right. The British Left Handers Club have dedicated Friday the 13th as Left Handers Day. Left Handers Day is a chance to showcase items specifically designed for left-handed people, like pens that shape the hand to write more comfortably 
with quick drying ink that won't smear as the left hand passes over the page. Other useful left-handed implements include vegetable peelers with the blade set on the opposite side to standard potato peelers which can confound the left-handed chef. While the emphasis is on fun, there is a serious message for manufacturers who don't always consider the left-handed customer. Bizarrely, the club claims that more babies are being born left-handed but can't explain why. Cuban writer Tomás Álvarez de los Ríos is never at a loss for words these days. Worried about the loss of idiomatic expressions in the Spanish language, Alvarez is preserving them by covering the outside of his home with sayings and famous quotes. For many years, the retired journalist has collected 4,000 sayings and written them on ceramic tablets that he stuck to the bricks of the four walls of his house in the eastern city of Sancti Spiritus. The 86-year-old writer said he started his unusual project in order to touch other people. His labor of love took a lot of time and energy, but Elvarez never faltered. Although Alvarez said many people simply thought he was crazy, he persevered with his project, creating a home that seems like it's built of words. Every weekend, Alvarez, who is a founding member of Cuba's ruling Communist Party, gathers neighbors on his veranda to recall more sayings for the collection. Tomás explained that while the project was intended to benefit others, it ended up bringing its creator unexpected rewards. Alvarez has covered every brick with sayings and is now plastering them onto the pillars of his veranda. Space is getting so short now that he plans to build an outhouse. <laughs>